my watch is telling me I need to get up and exercise. <laughs> Good afternoon, and I would like to welcome all the participants to today's uh, distance learning opportunity for our IFTI instructors. This is one of uh, this one is going to be on sexual harassment, and we have the pleasure of having um, Warren Borsch and Marty Miltz, who are the fund attorneys, um, uh, for, uh, who are the fund attorneys for the IFTI, and I believe LMCI as well, but IFTI as well. Um, and this is they're going to do an abbreviated version today uh, on the updates to the sexual harassment uh, laws that have gone into effect or will be going into effect. And this is a class that both uh, taught out at District Council 16, where we had instructors from both District Council 16 and District Council 36. So it's a truncated version, but uh, we wanted to make sure that um, this was a class that we were hoping to do back in Hanover. Um, but um, because of the current situation, we just want, we're going to still continue to offer um, uh, these types of learning opportunities uh, while we remain closed. Um, so, so with that, um, just, and I'll talk, maybe bring this up uh, close at the end, or I'll use some things in the, te uh, the, the chat box, but, you know, there's also e-learning, there's also curriculum within the, uh, the LMS for this course, uh, FTI uh, 1008. Uh, there's e-learnings in there um, as well that you can use, you can take to brush up, as well as um, give out to your apprentices uh, or your members as you see fit. Um, so as you'll see, some of you have been out, I see a lot of different names. There's a lot of folks on here. I know there's a lot of information, so I'm not going to hold anybody up here. But if you have questions, um, there's the chat box there. Um, uh, you can ask them. I'm sure uh, Marty and Warren will ask for questions throughout, and I think there's some questions built in, obviously, through the training. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, to Warren uh, and or Marty, whoever's going first, and um, hope you guys enjoy the training. Thanks, Tyler. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Marty Mills. Uh, as Tom mentioned, Warren and I are counsel for the FTI and uh, the LMCI and LMP. Uh, we have given this presentation once before uh, and in person, uh, which will probably be a bit different than what we're going to go through today. We're going to do our best. We're all trying to uh, figure out how to live in this new world. Um, the presentation uh, we put together uh, was initially put together for the California training centers. Uh, and that's because California has some of the most, uh, I don't know how you want to describe this, advanced, up-to-date, cutting edge, let's say. Uh, proactive. Proactive uh, uh, takes on uh, harassment. Uh, not simply sexual harassment, uh, but harassment of all stripes related to uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, and as you'll see, uh, California actually has 17 different possible cat categories uh, of uh, individual characteristics uh, one can discriminate upon. Uh, so we've altered this presentation somewhat, but we're still teaching to the California curriculum to a degree because anything that you see in your home state will be covered by what is covered by California. Uh, or the, the minimal coverage you might have will be subsumed within 
the broad coverage that California has uh, regarding its protection of individuals from harassment at work. Um, I, th I think it's important to uh, remember that, uh, and this California example is a good indication of this, that individual states will more likely than not have uh, independent statutory schemes dealing with harassment in the workplace, uh, along with uh, uh, protection from discrimination for a variety of reasons. Most will follow the federal guidelines, uh, which we will discuss, uh, and some may have, as California does, have stricter uh, programs and protocols in place. And you should also be mindful that uh, e even local governments, particularly in larger cities, uh, will have uh, protections from harassment, discrimination, uh, because of categories that aren't necessarily covered either by federal or state law. Uh, you'll particularly see that in major cities regarding uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, rights, trans rights, uh, things of that nature. Uh, are often protected by large cities. So if there is a particular question about whether or not one of these classifications would be covered in your home area, it's probably best directed to your, uh, your local council. Uh, we will do what we can to answer any specific questions today. I think this presentation works best if it's participatory. Um, I guess we'll start with chatting questions. Uh, if you can find the chat function, uh, on your screen there, um, or, or raising hands and, and speaking when called upon. Uh, if there's something you need to get our attention, unmute yourself and, and, and speak up as well. So one of the things that Marty and I discussed with the group in California was that um, the, the landscape with regard to harassment, particularly sexual harassment in the workplace has changed things which uh, had been deemed, quote, acceptable and unquote for years uh, in the workplace uh, since it was primarily a male dominated uh, environment uh, are no longer acceptable. And that change has been going on over time and has more recently, uh, both under federal and state law, uh, been uh, incorporated into those statutory schemes to not only make it inappropriate or some of this conduct inappropriate, but also unlawful. So Marty, you want to review the learning objectives of what we want to try to go over today? Sure. So we're going to be looking at the elements of sexual harassment uh, and, and the remedies available, uh, both under California and federal laws. And as we said, you'll fall somewhere within that spectrum. Uh, you are certainly covered by federal law wherever you are. Um, and there will be state law to some degree that will either match the federal or be somewhere short of what California provides, provides for. Um, we'll look at various forms of unlawful harassment. It's not simply, you know, one-on-one -on -one quid pro quo uh, that we're looking at. Uh, it's hostile work environment. Uh, it's, it's the broader uh, workplace. Uh, that, that's important to be mindful of here, and that you and everyone uh, under your authority, uh, be that teachers or uh, apprentices, uh, you have a responsibility to be mindful of these rules uh, and, and help change the environment within your training center. Uh, we'll go through some strategies. There'll be some videos uh, that, that hopefully will work here. Um, and uh, you know, then we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over and open uh, it up to questions as many as we possibly can. Um, so this is probably one of the more important slides uh, of uh, the presentation because it illustrates uh, the, the broad difference or potential difference between federal law and state law, um, starting with how many or what types of employers are covered. Uh, under federal law, you, you're not covered unless you have at least 15 employees uh, as an employer. So if you have 10 people, uh, there's not really a case to be made that you can be sued for sexual harassment. Um, so there are thresholds to be met there. Under state law, there may not be. California has no limit whatsoever. If you employ one person, uh, you are subject to their laws concerning harassment. 
Um, there's also a, a spectrum of what individuals or classes of individuals uh, might be covered as the offending party who could be a potential defendant here. Um, in the federal system, uh, it's really just employee and an employer uh, of direct nature. Uh, so in your cases, anybody who works for your local training center uh, are, are the individuals uh, who would be subject to a lawsuit because of violation of Title VII um, of the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Um, okay. There is no application to independent contractors, uh, volunteers, unpaid interns, or anybody else in the universe of your uh, in, in employment relationships. Uh, that's not necessarily the case under state law, uh, and that's something that you'll need to be mindful of in your home jurisdiction. Um, there can be a range of uh, liability standards for what uh, constitutes uh, uh, actionable uh, harassment. Uh, under the federal system, an employer's responsibility is to only not be negligent. Uh, that means you have to, in a, in a general sense, institute uh, a, a reporting program, uh, be mindful of, of uh, uh, the use of that program, uh, distribute it broadly, and when complaints are made, you address them. Uh, it has to be an actual program. Uh, so you're, you're liable under the federal rules only if you are negligent in, uh, in implementing your policy um, or not having a policy at all. Uh, under state law, it can be as severe as California is to have strict liability. That means if it happens under the employer's roof, the employer is responsible for it. They don't need to know about it. They can stop at a certain level uh, of supervisory status and everyone below knows, but the, the decision makers or, or, or higher up decision makers don't necessarily know, doesn't matter. If it happened under the employer's roof, the employer is liable. Um, so the other, there, there's uh, another interesting distinction, uh, at least under the federal statutory scheme, there are only 10 protected classes of individuals or individual uh, uh, th that are protected uh, by the under the EEOC and Title VII. Things like race, color, religion or creed, national origin, sex, age, uh, physical or mental disability, veteran status, genetic information and citizenship are the federal uh, protected classes. California uh, has 17 protected classes. They add things like ancestry, uh, marital status, um, how you identify yourself as uh, with regard to gender. So again, it's an example of what states have done uh, to expand on the federal protections. And on that, as we meant, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Well, we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, these are the classes protected under California law, uh, but you're only going to see employees and applicants protected from uh, discrimination under federal law. Uh, and applicants is itself a little bit weird. Uh, that, that would be more uh, discrimination than a harassment situation. Whereas under California law, you could actually have harassment by applicants or contractors or other folks not necessarily directly in an employee-employer relationship. Um, so a, a video that we want to start with here today, I'm not sure uh, how familiar everyone is uh, with the EEOC regulations so far as they apply to, uh, and, and that's the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission regulations as they apply to uh, uh, apprentice training uh, funds. At the tail end of the Obama administration, new rules were implemented uh, in an effort to uh, both expand uh, diversity within uh, uh, apprenticeship programs, uh, but to make sure that there was access to the EEOC uh, for apprentices uh, and, and everyone within the program, and to make sure that uh, training centers take the steps to make clear to participants in their programs 
uh, that these are avenues available to them if they find themselves in a situation where they are being harassed or discriminated against. Uh, and these are pretty important for every training center. You can lose your registered status uh, if you do not stay up to date uh, with, with these regulations. Uh, and they include uh, some training for everyone who may have contact with an apprentice. Now, that seems pretty broad because it is. I think everybody uh, in, in a training center certainly uh, has contact with an apprentice, but also everyone out in the field has contact with an apprentice. So as written, this would seem to require that every, every one of your members needs to have some level of training uh, about harassment. Um, none of this has been actually enforced yet. Uh, it remains to be seen whether it will, uh, but the upside is the Department of Labor has put together uh, a presentation that basically ticks that box and satisfies that training. So if you haven't seen this yet, this will satisfy the training for all of you, uh, but I would encourage, uh, this is linked on the uh, FTI website, you'll be able to get it, that you show this as broadly as possible uh, in your home training center, in your home local, uh, and, and try uh, to uh, create a record of how many times you have shown it and who you have shown it to, uh, just in case the DOL ever comes knocking. Uh, so, with no further delay, here is uh, the EEOC presentation. Everyone could hear that, right? No, I no. can't hear it. Oh, it was, yeah. it's, pa it's paused now, but... No. Let me see. Negative. Can't hear nothing. Nope. It's done. I cannot hear it. Gee, it worked yesterday. It did. <laughs> oh, hang on. I've got an idea. With the pictograms, though, I think we can find a kind of figure out what we're not supposed to do. Right. All right. Let's, let's try this. Welcome to Introduction to Anti-Harassment in Apprenticeship Program. Some people think of harassment as something that happens to other people at other companies. Other people experience harassment firsthand on a regular basis. And still others are aware of situations that are making someone else uncomfortable, but are unsure what they can do about it. The truth is, harassment can happen to anyone in any company regardless of their position or whether they are male or female. But it is more likely to happen to people who have less power in the workplace or are perceived as being outside the norm of what has traditionally been expected there. Historically, women, minorities, and LGBT workers have been particularly likely to experience harassment in the workplace. But they are by no means the only targets. Harassment occurs when the actions of one or more people creates a situation where an individual worker or group of workers feels uncomfortable, belittled, offended, threatened, or intimidated in the workplace. When workplace harassment is because of someone's religion, sex, race, color, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, age, or genetic information, it may be unlawful. The same is true if someone is harassed because they filed an EEO complaint. Harassment may be unlawful when it is unwelcome and so frequent or severe that it creates a work environment that a reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive, or otherwise results in an adverse employment decision, such as the individual being fired or demoted. Such harassment, intimidation, or retaliation will not be permitted in our apprenticeship program at all. It's important to understand and recognize which situations could be considered unlawful harassment. The harasser can be a coworker, the person supervising an apprentice, the training director, or even a customer or vendor. Both men and women can be harassers or targets. Unlawful harassment may include offensive or crude language or behavior bullying, intimidation, and discrimination. Some harassment situations involve obvious discriminatory behavior, for example, sexual comments, 
racial slurs, or physical aggression or verbal abuse directed only at individuals with disabilities. But unlawful harassment is not always easy to recognize. For example, one person may think she is just telling harmless jokes to a friend, while a bystander may find that joke offensive. Actions or language that might not offend one person might bother someone else. In some situations, people accused of harassment actually believe that their actions are welcome or funny. Regardless of whether one person intends to offend another, a behavior may be unlawful harassment if it is unwelcome and has the effect of offending a reasonable person. Any harassment can have a negative impact on individuals and the company, especially if it is unlawful. Harassment can affect an apprentice's ability to work effectively, or even the effectiveness of the whole team. Harassment can negatively impact individuals. Oops. Was he in that movie with Mark Lost Wahlberg? Volume. The Druggy Brother? What was that movie called? Effect of offending a reasonable person. Any harassment can have a negative impact on individuals and the company, especially if it is unlawful. Harassment can affect an apprentice's ability to work effectively, or even the effectiveness of the whole team. Harassment can negatively impact individuals, our program culture, recruitment and retention of apprentices, our legal standing, and our reputation in the community. If you have experienced harassment, consider making it clear to the harasser that the behavior is unwelcome and against company policy, and maybe against the law. If the harasser thought it was a joke or otherwise wasn't aware of how it was being received. However, if addressing the situation with the harasser directly proves to be ineffective, or if you are concerned about the impact of a direct confrontation on your safety or well being, you should report it directly to your manager, human resources, or other appropriate organization resource. Doing so can prevent similar incidents from happening to someone else and may resolve the situation you are experiencing. Retaliation against any apprentice or employee who reports harassment or other kinds of discrimination or participates in an investigation may also be unlawful and will not be tolerated. The apprenticeship program has an obligation to investigate any harassment claims and take appropriate action to ensure that unlawful harassment does not continue. Some harassment situations may result in legal action or employee termination. If they are harassed because of their race, color, national origin, sex, religion, sexual orientation, age, or genetic information, apprentices also have the right to file complaints with the agency with which the apprenticeship program is registered. Contact information for this agency is posted in our workplace. Every employee has the right to work in an environment that is free of harassment, intimidation, and retaliation. We all have a responsibility to contribute to an environment where all employees, including apprentices, regardless of their diverse races, ethnic and genetic backgrounds, genders, ages, disabilities, and sexual orientations, are valued and respected. Okay, so you have now satisfied one of the requirements of the EEOC regulations. Uh, in, in addition to that, there is uh, a statement that your local uh, training center needs to adopt, um, pledging that you will not engage in any of these activities. And there are also postings uh, that are required to be put up. Uh, if you don't have those, those are certainly available through the FTI. And you should have your, your training centers should have policies dealing with harassment and these issues. Uh, the policies establish uh, what is harassment. Uh, they establish uh, the uh, ways in which uh, individuals affected by harassment in the workplace or in the training center can uh, address uh, that conduct or misconduct and tells you what the policies are for the training center of the training center to address claims of harassment 
uh, how they'll be investigated, who's going to be responsible for all of those things, and what the pers uh, prospective penalties might be, uh, depending on the circumstances and depending on the outcome of the investigation. But that's something that we recommend, and I think virtually every training center has or should have in place. I'm, I'm certain there are sample policies uh, that the FTI can provide. Um, okay, so who, who is liable for harassment? Uh, it, it's, it's every employer, the FTI itself, uh, but it's also uh, the individuals in the workplace uh, who, who are committing the harassment, who may uh, expose themselves to individual liability uh, depending on their conduct. Um, there, there is the possibility for personal liability uh, for damages caused by uh, the, the harasser. Um, so there is incentive to behave correctly here, uh, not just on behalf of your organization, but on behalf of yourself. You know, and employers uh, can be liable for harassment by non-supervisory employees uh, if the employer knew or should have known about the behavior and failed to take steps to remedy it. Um, one of the issues in that context is knowledge, uh, which again, as Marty pointed out early on, some states have avoided that issue by uh, imposing strict liability on employers uh, for any harassing behavior, um, whether they knew about it or not. But the general rule is, at least the federal policy is in this context, that the employer can only be liable if they knew about it or should have known about it, didn't take appropriate action. Next slide. Here we go. Um, th this is kind of significant. Uh, there are two types of sexual harassment in the workplace. And one is, uh, quid pro quo, and the quid pro quo is um, somewhat easier, I think, to identify because it is, uh, as you can see from A and B, demanding sexual favors in exchange for employment benefits, or B, demanding sexual favors by threatening negative employment actions. And those things can include discipline, termination, uh, denial of promotions, uh, uh, th there's a, a whole litany of things that can happen to an individual uh, if their supervisor uh, uses sexual favoritism or sexual favors uh, to adversely affect the employment status of a coworker. And it can happen in the uh, apprenticeship perspective as well uh, in terms of uh, uh, assignments, in terms of getting employment opportunities, in terms of moving the uh, uh, apprenticed up through the uh, the steps. Marty, I lost the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Sorry. The other, the, the other... Chat issue here. Ah, okay. So the, the other, um, I don't know if anybody can see this, but the other type of sexual harassment, which the courts and the law have recognized is what's called hostile work environment. Uh, and what that encompasses is harassing behavior uh, which is directed towards an individual it's witnessed or it may be directed against someone else but it's witnessed by the individual who's complaining uh, or favoritism uh, of a sexual nature uh, that infects the workplace and that means that uh, a particular person who is uh, involved sexually with a supervisor or someone in management is getting uh, uh, preferential treatment uh, or women are getting uh, disenfranchised or not getting the same treatment that the men are. Um, and, and that's a sometimes more difficult uh, uh, part of the uh, policy to uh, identify and, and uh, enforce. And sometimes they are similar and overlap, uh, but this gives you a sense of the kinds of conduct uh, that is deemed to be unlawful and actionable. Right, right. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, we've all had some exposure to all of these, either in popular media or, or uh, in, in our own lives. 
the first quid pro quo is, is something that, you know, when people think of sexual harassment, that's generally what they think of, uh, a, a bad actor doing wrong. Uh, it's, it's the second category, hostile work environment, uh, that it is far easier for uh, a, a culture to develop uh, that can create liability uh, for your training center uh, if you are not careful. Uh, that's because it's not necessarily uh, attacking one individual person. Uh, it's about, you know, how that person perceives uh, their welcomeness or acceptance within your organization. Um, so remedies, well, this kind of jumps ahead. Warren, do you want to, did I lose you? No, I'm here. Um... Yeah, so if there is an investigation by the employer or by the uh, training center as the employer, uh, and, the, and the investigation determines that there has been improper conduct on the part of a trainer or a supervisor, um, the, these are some of the remedies that are available uh, under the law uh, to address that improper behavior. Some of it will depend on the impact on the individual. So the courts will grant injunctive relief. Uh, they will require, which will tell the, uh, the employer or the training center to stop the conduct that's being complained of. It, it could require that the, the employer uh, develop training programs and provide training for its employees and, and management staff particularly, and certainly to develop uh, and change and or enforce policies and procedures uh, that address these types of issues and behavior. Uh, if someone has experienced uh, economic losses as a result of the uh, improper conduct, they've been fired, they've been disciplined uh, and lost wages uh, or demoted and lost the, the wages of a higher paying position, uh, they can sue and get uh, those monies back uh, through uh, remedial action. If they've been so uh, <clears throat> damaged where they've had to seek out uh, medical attention, uh, whether it's uh, psychological uh, or otherwise, uh, they, can be, they, they can get reimbursed for that. And if they are forced out of their job, either because they've been fired or it's, such a it's become such a hostile work environment that they can no longer uh, stay at the job, uh, or in the program, uh, the cost of finding something else can be the responsibility of the employer. Uh, then there's also non-economic damages uh, for things like emotional distress, loss of enjoyment of life, and punitive damages if the, action, if the actionable conduct is that outrageous and egregious. And these are similar to, to things that you see in uh, certain types of uh, um, negligence actions, uh, automobile accidents and other type of accidents where these are all the types of economic damages that someone who's injured as a result of the inappropriate conduct of another party can get out of a court action. Um, I think that might be a good spot to stop to see if we have some questions uh, before we move on to some hypotheticals. I don't know if we do. Do you see them, Martin? I don't see them. I, I think if I got a chat, I would see. You would see, right? Yeah. All right. Well, feel free. We're going to move on to the questions. If something pops up, uh, we'll do our best. So, true or false, the promise or reward of reward or threat of punishment in exchange for sexual favors must be explicit in order to constitute quid pro quo sexual harassment. Uh, that means it has to be, I will give you this for that. Uh, we've heard a lot about that uh, in, in, in the world in the past six months. Um, true or false? Uh, an employee who gives in to the demand for sex in order to avoid negative consequences forfeits his or her claim for quid pro quo sexual harassment. So if they agree, then it's not harassment is the premise of that question. Is that true or false? And finally, if the alleged harasser denies the charge, 
a claim for sexual harassment cannot be successful without a neutral witness or documentary, documentary evidence supporting the complainant's accusations. True or false? Let's see if I can do this. I saw it there a moment ago. <laughs> I have a quick question there kind you of go. off the grid here. Sure. Since you're messing around with your Zoom right now, <laughs> we're doing e learning from, from home with our apprentices. How do you go ahead and uh, do it to where they only see the PowerPoint slide and not the notes and all that other stuff? Oh, uh, there's a, you, you just start a presentation. Okay, that's just a presentation under slideshow? Yep. All right, thank you. Now, if anybody can tell me how you get to the chat, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so let's go through our answers. Yeah, so if the, the first uh, true or false was the promise or reward of reward or threat in exchange for sexual favors must be explicit in order to constitute quid pro quo sexual harassment. And that's false. It doesn't have to be you either do this or this is going to happen. It can be less explicit and uh, it could be inferred. It could be pretty evident without someone saying what's what's expected. I need you to do a favor for me. It's pretty explicit. Right. Uh, but you don't have to have the words or the explicit statement in order to make it uh, in inappropriate, improper sexual harassment. And number two, an employee who gives in to the demand for sex in order to avoid negative consequences forfeits his or her claim for quid pro quo sexual harassment. That is absolutely false. Uh, the cases are, there's a lot of them that talk about how employees are fearful of their jobs or are in uh, positions uh, where they are uh, afraid of their supervisor, or afraid of the management person who's making the demand or putting them in the position of quid pro quo sex um, and don't come forward until they are absolutely unable to avoid the situation further. Uh, they do not forfeit their claim. Um, uh, but so three also, if the alleged harasser denies the charge, the claim for sexual harassment cannot be successful without a neutral witness or documentary evidence supporting the complainant's accusation. That's also false. But it does give rise to uh, some of the issues that come up in investigations, uh, which are mandatory under the, uh, the law. Uh, the employer must investigate a claim of uh, harassment, sexual harassment. And those investigations can be difficult if there's no uh, specific evidence one way or the other. Uh, so there's a lot of credibility evidence, uh, circumstantial evidence to support the claims. And it's particularly under the federal statutory scheme somewhat important because welcome sexual behavior, as opposed to unwelcome sexual behavior, can be a basis for an employer avoiding liability. So it really can become a, a little bit of a difficult uh, uh, road to uh, maneuver down uh, and a little bit of a quagmire when you get into the investigation. Uh, but it's incumbent upon the employer to do the investigation and to take all the steps uh, through that investigation to talk to witnesses and to get as much information as they can uh, in reaching its conclusion as to whether or not uh, the claim is true. And those credibility determinations can be the most difficult part uh, of these investigations. Which side do you believe? Uh, do you believe them equally? Uh, they, they turn into some hard decisions to make. Uh, and, and when you get to that point, you should definitely be consulting your local council uh, as, as to how to handle uh, situations of that nature. It's so easy to like, deal with the like, If we can mute, if we're not uh, speaking. So the, the essence of quid pro quo uh, harassment is uh, authority. It's a, it's a supervisor. Uh, it's someone with apparent or actual authority to affect somebody's working life. Um, uh, and, and the threat can be expressed or implied. Um, so the leader of the free world 
does have some actual authority, both uh, in, in making promises to other nations or to give equal time uh, what he expects of his interns. Uh, okay, another hypothetical. Uh, Blake, the sole proprietor of Acme Co., has decided to expand and compete for state contracts. Blake hires Jack, an independent contractor, to install a computer network. Jill responds to Blake's Craigslist ad for an office manager. Blake threatens to sue Jack for breach of contract unless Jack agrees to engage in sexual activity. Blake also tells Jill the job is hers if she agrees to have sex. So there's a couple of different ways to look at this. So Jack can't sue Blake because he is an independent contractor. That's gonna depend. Uh, Jill can't sue Blake because Acme Co. Ha has fewer than five employees. Again, gonna depend. Uh, Jack can't sue Blake because he is a man. Mm, skeptical of that one. Uh, Jack and Jill can sue Blake for quid pro, quid pro quo sexual harassment. Uh, seems pretty direct. Uh, Jack can sue Blake for quid pro quo sexual harassment, but Jill cannot. So, in various scenarios, some of these might be true, but obviously, Blake has made uh, an offer, uh, uh, a demand, a demand uh, one in exchange for the other to both Jack and Jill. What they have, what's described there is very clear uh, quid pro quo sexual har harassment. Um, the others uh, are, are, are worth talking about. Uh, independent contractors is gonna depend on, on your state. It's possible that he may not have rights as an independent contractor um, in, in this scenario. Um, if they have fewer than five employees, uh, under the federal system, that's not going to meet the threshold. Uh, Jill would not have a, a case there. Um, obviously, uh, gender is irrelevant. Uh, uh, a man can harass a man, a woman can harass a woman, and every variation of that you can think of. Um, I'm not sure what the logic of E was, but obviously <laughs> the correct answer. Any thoughts, questions? Okay, let's move along. Uh, another exercise, Sarah is the deputy director of a state agency. She approaches Nancy, an office technician, and says, hi, Nancy, I have seen you at the gym. You seem to have a great time in Zumba and so sexy. Nancy, I'd love to take you to Tahoe this weekend, just the two of us. Nancy is stunned and intimidated by the attention. She says, well, Sarah, I'm flattered, but I'm not interested. Sarah smiles wanly and says, well, I had to ask, you are just so sexy, but I get it. I'll leave you alone. Sarah does not proposition or engage in any unwelcome conduct towards Nancy again. Three months later, Nancy is late to work for three days and her supervisor threatens to deny her uh, uh, leave, I guess that is in that context, uh, if she is late again. So, the best answer, Nancy can establish a claim for quid pro quo sexual harassment because Sarah should never have asked a subordinate on a date. B, Nancy cannot establish a claim for quid pro quo sexual harassment because there is no evidence that she is a lesbian. And C, Nancy's claim for quid pro quo, pr quid pro quo sexual harassment is weak because there is no evidence that Sarah was offering job benefits if Nancy said yes or threatening punishment if Nancy said no. So the best answer is C, uh, even though there was some subsequent uh, employment impact down the road, it does not appear that it was related to the original offer um, and nothing really happened uh, to um, Nancy as a result of her saying no to the offer. So that's kind of an interesting uh, hypothetical because there, uh, there has to be a quo, pro quo and the analysis here is it didn't have that impact. So there was a ask 
but no reaction or no uh, conduct taken or action taken by the supervisor slash employer because the answer was no. I think this hypothetical illustrates how difficult these questions can be and how fraught uh, the idea of asking a subordinate out uh, or for, for, for uh, sexual behavior of any kind uh, with a subordinate. Because in this scenario, even though her claim is weak, this is the kind of thing where an employer if it knows of this situation, and it's not clear that Sarah uh, was the one who made any decision regarding uh, uh, discipline uh, for her being late, but uh, it, this is the kind of situation where I think if Nancy filed a claim here, it might survive summary judgment because it does, it does basically appear that there was something offered. Uh, and and she declined it and she suffered a negative circumstance. Now it would be her burden ultimately to prove that she was harmed sometime in the future, uh, but it could end up costing the company or the training center uh, a, a significant amount of money to defend that case uh, somewhere down the line. So these are tough situations, especially if you end up dealing with a very litigious person, which we all know they are out there. Out there. And, and, you know, once that idea is placed that there has been this sexual behavior uh, that Nancy could possibly feel immune from, from any negative consequences because she has this in her pocket as a claim to be made against the employer. Three things, though. I think Nancy, if she makes a complaint, uh, even if she does it after she is disciplined or threatened with discipline, uh, for her, uh, her for her absence, uh, the employer has an obligation to investigate. It may turn out that uh, the investigation comes up with C, which there is no connection between the discipline uh, or the potential discipline later on or the loss of the uh, the sick time. Uh, but it's still an obligation to, uh, to to investigate, and I think that's an important. Uh, think for us to take out of this, that if there is a uh, complaint made by uh, an, an individual, there is an obligation to investigate. That doesn't mean that there'll be a finding against uh, the individual who the claim, against who the claim is made, but there's still an obligation to investigate. If the employer blows off the individual, that's a problem. Uh, and it may turn out that there is something, as Marty said, uh, that does connect the dots and that subsequent uh, denial of uh, time off or paid time off might be uh, connected to the initial ask. And, and the other, the other thing I wanted, the, one other thing I wanted to, we're going to get into it in a minute, but hostile work environment is, is kind of the next topic we're going to talk about, the two types of sexual harassment. We talk about quid pro quo. Hostile work environment doesn't have the essential element of having to be asked for asked to do something, or if you don't do it, then you lose something. That, that's the quid pro quo. Hostile work environment, if there's conduct uh, directed at the individual that uh, creates a, uh, an adverse uh, work or a hostile work environment, uh, that could be enough to violate the, the law against the sexual harassment. The problem is, or the difficulty is, what, uh, what's the type or the amount of behavior that actually supports that kind of claim? And what you're going to hear in a minute uh, is that one act alone, at least under federal law, is not sufficient to uh, satisfy the requirement of establishing a hostile work environment. So if what we just went through with Nancy and Sarah was the only example, it would not have met the hostile work environment uh, uh, criteria for under federal law. We've got uh, Chelsea. Do you want to speak up? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I do have a bit of a. There, there, there's a volume issue, Chelsea. Is this better? Yeah, it's better. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so I do have a bit of a question. Being that most of us are trying to transition to the online environment, I know that. 
the guidelines for sexual harassment hasn't extended into the cyber sexual harassment um, portal yet is actually in the state of Florida, a different statute that doesn't actually cover that. So is there um, any information that we can, you know, help, you know, uh, set a guideline for our teachers um, when they do start doing lectures where they have students um, talking to each other in the chat and they may say something, you know, crude or lewd about the instructor or about one another? The answer is I don't think there's anything specific out there at the moment, but it probably is coming, number one. Number two, I think the general rules that we're going over would apply for the most part in the uh, environment that you're dealing with. I, I think that if there is, uh, there are comments in the chat rooms of a sexual nature and they're offensive or could be offensive to someone on the chat, then that's a problem. Right, especially if it is in within the bounds of something that the employer has control over. So if it was say an environment like this, uh, uh, you know, this is clearly an extension of the classroom uh, that, uh, you know, is, is the business that you are in. Um, I, I would say that, you know, there's probably definite possibility for liability there. But it's a good point because what we're dealing with primarily are actual person-to-person uh, -person contacts in the workplace. So you, you are raising a very good issue and one that uh, is certainly going to have to be addressed in the future as we do more of these uh, electronic uh, teaching sessions. I have a question following up on what Chelsea said, actually. Um, so from a, if you're running a Zoom chat room or a Zoom classroom or whatever, um, and you're, you're the one hosting, uh, is it possible for you to see private chats happening within that, that Zoom chat you're running? Or are those always going to be private? I, I do believe they're private. I mean, I'm not certain on uh, uh, the technology of it. Okay. Um, and that would put it outside your scope of knowledge. You're not negligent if you're yeah, not acting exactly. upon something you don't know about. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but you know, if you are made aware of that, if it is reported uh, by an apprentice that absolutely, you know, another was making these comments throughout. Um, I mean, I have to wonder as a factual basis if you can go and get those comments. I'm not certain about that as a technical matter. Or uh, but if it, but you it would start be relevant to an investigation. Yeah. Or if you when you start the train, you know, giving a, a heads up to all students to say if there is some sort of sexual harassment or something like that happening that they should document, the, which should be easy to do and send you that so that, you know, something could be done about it. Um, as opposed to something happened, the student closes out the chat and then whatever proof of that harassment's lost forever. Lost kind of address it ahead of time. Great point, great point. We, want, we want all someone, of our apprentices to document everything. That's part of the, part of the education. Yeah, and if, it's, just, if, it, if private chats aren't documented automatically, go ahead and raise that point ahead of time. Yeah, take a yeah. screenshot. Someone suggested that the host could turn off personal chats, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. And you might be able to save chats uh, as the host. Um, did we That's get all the hands? I was wondering if you, were, if you were a host, if you could see the private chats in your thing, and I guess maybe you can, so that's good. So, Mara, let's try to go yeah, quickly let's, let's through some of because we're running out of time. And yep. Thought it would be helpful to uh, perhaps go through the uh, hostile work environment criteria. Uh, sure. Uh, well, there could be three ways this could happen. It does not have to be uh, directed at the person making the complaint, uh, although that is a possibility uh, for a hostile work environment. Uh, if someone is consistently subjected to uh, negative images, stuff like that, uh, that, that would count. Uh, but it could also be uh, uh, not even specifically about the person uh, who, who is filing the complaint, um, or it could be a generalized environment issue where it is, uh, ad advantages seem to be given uh, for uh, uh, reasons of a sexual nature. Um, it can be verbal, visual, or physical. Uh, 
I think all that is pretty self-evident, but uh, jokes, pictures, touching can, can fall in any of those categories. Um, pretty self-evident. Um, leering and staring, I think, are pretty uh, difficult to make cases about, but if they add up with everything else, um, uh, could constitute hostile, hostile work environment. Um, physical uh, touching, uh, always uh, something to be uh, avoided in a professional environment. And under the, before you get there, Martin, under, under federal law, um, those acts have to be somewhat pervasive and again, more than one. Uh, severe and pervasive. Not, severe and pervasive, and unless the, the one act is so egregious and outrageous, uh, you might get over that hurdle. But for the most part, uh, and, and a single act will not be sufficient uh, to uh, get you over the hurdle of uh, protected, uh, a protected situation under the federal statutory scheme. Running out of time, but there are some uh, demonstration videos uh, available at this link, which will be available in, in the materials for the FTI. Uh, skip ahead over these exercises. You okay with that, Warren? Yes. So severe and per pervasive. Um, so alter the conditions of employment to the extent that it creates a hostile or abusive work environment. Uh, so it has to be bad and it should be considered uh, along these lines when conducting your investigation. Uh, the, the nature of the conduct, frequency, uh, the period of time uh, the, that it occurred, physically threatening or humiliating, obviously is going to be given greater weight, um, and the extent to which it interferes with uh, an employee's work performance. Um, because that's that's the case that they'll be trying to prove is that this was so bad, it made it impossible for me to do my job. Um, that, that's the kind of case that really moves forward. We have time now. Let's, let's, I think we have to skip the exercises. Um, okay. Same sex sexual harassment, that's actionable. Absolutely. I don't think there's much question about that. Um, also, it doesn't matter uh, if the conduct is motivated by sexual desire. Um, <laughs> Kind of an outdated thing. I know that cites a, a California case, but that would be that would be the case the world over. Um, uh, it's it's uh, as you're probably aware more often about power than sex. Yeah. By the way, the PowerPoint will be will be available uh, through FTI, and if you want to go back and do the see the exercises, they are interesting and at least and I think helpful in many respects. Um, so this is uh, an interesting component of, of all of this. Lack of defense, lack of action by the victim. The victim could have avoided part or most of the harm if they had taken advantage of the, of the employer's procedures for addressing sexual harassment. That's the avoidable consequences doctrine. Uh, and two, the amount of harm to the victim could have been less if the employee had taken action if I were to mitigate damages. Uh, so those are things which an employer uh, can raise as defensive defenses if the complaining individual had not followed the uh, policies and the guidelines that the employer set up for uh, complaint and investigation of complaints. And if they had raised it sooner, um, they, they could have perhaps uh, lessened the amount of impact on their uh, lives, on their work uh, life, and on uh, any economic loss. So that can come into play in terms of uh, any action that they might bring. Uh, I, I will, one thing that, uh, you know, we talk about this a lot in some of these classes about uh, hearing the old adage, well, we always did it this way. And I think one of the things that I've come across over the years in dealing with sexual harassment issues are situations where uh, the uh, actor says, well, we always joked around like this. You know, this is something that we always did. And she was part of the, you know, she joked around too, or they joked around too. Um, and, and that kind of prior uh, experience uh, under these circumstances is not a defense. 
Uh, if it gets to the point where uh, the conduct escalates and the employee uh, affected by it has particularly said, stop, I don't like it anymore, I don't want to do this anymore, uh, then it's actionable. And uh, it doesn't matter if in the past they may have participated. Mark, anything? Uh, I, I'd echo that, um, but I, I think you see in this uh, kind of the, the, the line that uh, employers walk and that they have to have a procedure in place uh, that, that is accessible uh, to, to everyone in the organization. Uh, but if that's not taken advantage of, uh, it's going to be viewed as to whether or not have they given enough access uh is it a system where somebody feels comfortable going forward uh, and if it's not uh, their lack of knowledge uh could could be a problem as well um and, and i think if you go to employers must take all reasonable steps for it um, okay there we go there you go so this gives you a sense of what the responsibility of the employer is this cites uh, California law, but it's basically the same for training funds under the new EEOC uh, in training uh, requirements and under the federal uh, statutory scheme. Uh, the, the employer must take all reasonable steps to prevent discrimination, has harassment and retaliation. Um, and that, that's something that they need to do, even if there's a specific action complained of or not complained of. Uh, or whether they knew or didn't know, they have a, an affirmative obligation to, through the posting of notices and overseeing conduct in the workplace, uh, to prevent uh, this type of act, action from happening. Uh, but the next slide talks about the policies and procedures that the employer should have in place. And I think what we talked about earlier, and what's I think the most critical, is the giving employees and uh, your apprentices uh, the, uh, the structure through which to uh, make a complaint. Uh, they need to know who to speak to, where to go, uh, and then the, what's going to happen after that complaint is made, and what can the employee uh, and, the, and or the apprentice uh, have reason to expect or uh, be comfortable that they can expect from the employer and the training center in that context. So there has to be uh, a complaint policy. There has to be an investigation, um, which involves conducting interviews, uh, giving the accused party a chance to respond, uh, and interviews of people who uh, maybe have, may have witnessed uh, the conduct. Uh, they have to get the documents that may be out there. Um, and it's, it's important that the employer and the training center has that uh, procedure in place know who's going to conduct the investigation. Uh, if, if a supervisor or trainer is the one who's been accused, they should not be the one conducting the investigation. That's pretty basic, but I think sometimes it gets lost in the, uh, in the, in the shuffle. Um, and training. Uh, I think it's really important, Martin, you want to talk about training? Because sure. this is covered by the statute. Sure. And in, in under state law, particularly in California, uh, there, there may be a requirement that you undergo uh, regular training in California for supervisors, uh, which uh, most, if not all of you would qualify as, uh, it, it's required every two years um, uh, to, to go through essentially this course. Um, so uh, you're, you're, you're getting a leg up here if your state uh, has that requirement uh, or it may sometime in the future, but it is good practice uh, uh, and you know would be evidence uh, in, in a situation where uh, uh, the training center was accused of uh, harassment or discrimination uh, that it has required as many of its employees as possible to go through training of this nature. Um, there are different kinds of training though as well, um, uh, particularly under uh, bullet point two there, uh, things that aren't required by the law. Uh, things related to implicit bias training. We all bring our own understandings of the world uh, to every situation that are shaped by our background, uh, but it is important for us to recognize that uh, not everyone shares our experiences uh, or, or, or how we approach relationships. 
uh, which is important in this context since, you know, the, the harasser will generally think that they're not doing wrong when they are causing harm to someone else. Uh, so having training that helps them to recognize that is important, uh, as well as uh, I, I think bystander intervention could be particularly uh, important as well, uh, since it is important that everybody in the organization uh, have the ability not just to spot when things are going wrong, but how they should react uh, to prevent things from getting out of control, uh, to prevent there from being a larger problem. Uh, also keeping records uh, regarding um, any reports that are made, the investigation uh, notes, who was involved, all of that extremely important. So leadership. So your trainers are supervisors. Uh, your directors of training are the top supervisor. Uh, and they're the ones uh, with the trainers who should be coming up with these policies and conducting themselves in ways which send the right message, not only to everyone on the staff, but to the apprentices as well. Uh, and that's true of any employer situation. Uh, hopefully we didn't rush through this too much and hopefully it was helpful. Um, if there is, <laughs> we don't need to skip, <laughs> you can skip over Don Draper. That's all right. Don't yeah. be like Don. Um, but we appreciate your participation. If, uh, there's any questions, we're happy to take them. Uh, or if you want to, uh, give those to, uh, the FTI, they'll get them to us and we can respond, uh, after the meeting is over. And anything we can do to improve on presentations like this, since we all are uh, learning to adjust to this new uh, remote new environment, reality. would be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Should we leave the meeting, I guess? Huh? Well, let's see if anybody has some questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to just shout something out. Thanks for my end. I appreciate it. It's uh, uncomfortable to even hear about, but it comes up, I guess. It absolutely does. And it's it, it can be a very difficult uh, road to go down and uh, maneuver around. There's a lot of pitfalls, and it isn't easy. Um, the investigations themselves can be difficult, uh, but it's, it's a necessary reality. You can get ahead of it. One of the things that we really recommend is are having these policies in place so that you're not caught uh, and you have something to fall back on in, in terms of how you handle these situations. This is, this is Tom. I want to thank uh, Warren and Marty and, and everyone that was able to get on the um, Zoom today. Um, continue to uh, look for other distance learning opportunities. I know we have the third workshop uh, Zoom training tomorrow. Uh, we have a couple of others that we'll be offering. So just uh, keep an eye out for those as they, as they come in. A couple that I know that are in the um, process of being developed. Uh, we're, there's one that we're going to be offering the first aid CPR through Cascade Learning. Um, we're working on a COVID ICRA training, um, which we'll be using the CPW. We'll, custom, we'll be customizing the CPWR curriculum. Uh, we'll probably have a HASCOM, um, as well as uh, maybe a tr abbreviated version of the PCB training as well. So, uh, again, we appreciate. Uh, Warren and Marty for their time. And again, uh, continue to look for those emails from the FTI International, as well as the resources that are available for you and your apprentices in the LMS. So with that, um, I hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Stay safe, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you.